Hola, comadres. Welcome to another episode of Comadre on the Podcast. I'm your host, Marcy. And today we have an amazing guest. His name is Chad, and I'm going to let him introduce himself. Who are you? Well, hey, Marcy. Thanks for having me on. Um, my name is Chad Youngquist. I am a uh, happily married man, father of two. Uh, we, ha- our oldest is our daughter and she's 17 and our son is 15 and he is autistic. And, um, I've spent the last several years, uh, on a few different platforms, uh, doing a couple of things in the autism space. And that's, uh, uh, we have a YouTube channel that, um, my son and I do where we just talk about what it's like to be an adolescent with autism. And then, I have a um, Instagram account that just does encouragement for parents uh, of children with, or uh, yeah, with uh, parents of children with special needs. Um, just because uh, I've you know been down the road for a long enough time now and have learned a lot of the stuff I know through the school of hard knocks, and my hope is that other parents, uh, don't learn a lot of the same stuff the hard way that, um, I can be of encouragement and, uh, kind of help people along in their journey as they're starting out. I love that. So Chad and I usually tell um, the listeners how I met my guests. So we haven't met in person as of yet, but Um, I started following your account because of Moments of Joy podcast. She had me posted something you had posted, like words of encouragement for parents. And I was just like, wow, he's like doing a lot of what we're doing. But like, it's nice to see it from a male perspective. And um, we don't see a lot of the dads like speaking out and like talking about their experiences um, being dads of children with special needs. So I feel like your your representation was needed. And um, I'm so glad that you're using your platform to encourage other parents and to help the community in general. Um, I didn't even know about the YouTube channel. Like I'm excited to go and watch some of the content that oh, you, yeah. you've been creating with your son. So... Today's topic, Omadres, is creating inclusive and accepting spaces for special needs parents. And um, the reason why the topic came up is since the goal is to create community and accepting environments on this podcast, I feel like, you know, touching on that, touching on that topic today would be important, especially because the focus of this season has been mental health awareness for our parents and you know, supporting our parents' mental health needs. Because a lot of the time, I feel like because we're caretakers, we neglect ourselves so much. So um, we're going to also talk about that documentary that you shared with us um, on your on your um, Instagram account a few days ago. Sure. So, um, but before we get into that, I want to just kind of get some of the preliminaries out of the way. Um, so what is your career? I'm actually a home builder by trade. I've been a home builder my entire career. And um, this last year, we uh, decided to uh, leave the industry. And so we're actually sort of transitioning right now. But we do have a couple of different construction companies, a uh, custom home building company and a, and a light um, uh, earthwork company. Um, but we are kind of putting certain aspects of that in other people's hands and moving on to different, uh, a different arena. And so, um, just, uh, part of my journey, uh, in this whole thing as being a parent in a, in a different circumstance has been learning to, um, sort of challenge myself in ways that I didn't know um, were possible. And being a dad of an autistic son is not something that I expected to be. And as a result of being one, I've really had to dig deep in a lot of aspects of my life and challenge myself to be better at a lot of different things, you know, relationally and my own, uh, mental and spiritual wellness and all those things. And one of the things that came up in my career is that I sort of lost passion and I thought to myself, well, I, I talk a big game about putting difficult things in my path so that 
I can overcome them and learn and grow and teach myself stuff. Um, if I'm going to practice what I preach while I'm uh, not having a good time with my current career, well, then as a 47-year-old man, why don't I just go ahead and reboot my entire life? And so that's what we chose to do. We just are... Uh, kind of abandoning the uh, companies that we built uh, from the ground up and going into a completely different sector. And so it's uh, it's just part uh, need a change of pace, part challenging myself to see if I can actually start over. So it's been kind of fun. That is so brave. Um, yeah, like I feel like during the pandemic, everybody just started reevaluating everything and it kind of just just came to head everybody was just kind of like you know deciding on what made them happy and choosing not to continue in those things that were not bringing them joy and I'm so happy that you guys are doing that because it's like you know you don't know what you're capable of until you push yourself and it sounds like you guys are really pushing yourselves out of your comfort zone and and really going forward and finding that thing that you know gives you that spark because the thing is you know, we wake up every morning and life is just, you know, cyclical all the time, right? We do the same things every day. But what is the point of being involved in the life, especially because we're like on the spiritual journey as well? Like, what is the point of being in the life that you're dreading every day to get up to go to work or you're dreading every day to get up and go to your business, right. you know? We need to be doing things that bring us joy because it, it, in turn that, you know, helps us become better parents in the long run. If our children see us happy, it's going to give them a goal in the future to be like, hey, you know, my dad was really happy with his job. He was like really, you know, passionate about what he was doing and he wanted to go to work every day. So, you know, it, it kind of it's like a trickle down effect, you know, um, so it, 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 it helps our kids strive for better and to have a better quality of life in the long run. Well, and when we choose to take the hard road and make a big life change, it, our kids get to see our struggle too. And they get to see how we manage uh, difficult things and we can model uh, not just, Hey, we're, we're, we're not satisfied in our current scenario. Um, we want to be happy. We want our kids to see us happy, but also we want our kids to see us struggle a little bit um, and and figure out whatever it is that might be so that they know that when tough times come about in their own lives, like they can think back on how did mom and dad uh, conduct themselves and what did they do about this? And so I uh, I had a great set of parents who modeled a lot of things really well for me and i really want to in turn do that for my kids as well that is so important um yeah growing up I, I'm, I'm i'm child of immigrants i'm like i came to this country when i was like one years old so you know the struggle is part of like the journey right yeah and our kids we try to save them so much i feel like in a way it's good and bad because like we try to save them so much from heartbreak and like, you know, struggling, but also that is what helped form us as adults, right? And te taught us to like persevere. Because that's another thing, like life is not always going to be easy. So it, it's, it's important for our kids to see us, you know, dealing with different types of difficulties and situations that are not, uh, you know, not everything is going to be cookie cutter and exactly how we want it to be. Yeah, I just had literally 15 minutes ago, I had this conversation with my son. He, <laughs> he got in a whole heap of trouble yesterday uh, with a bad attitude and it just kept going and going and going. And finally, I just, I, I had a consequence and I said, if, uh, you know, screens are a big deal in our house. He he has a couple things that he likes to do where he's checking sports scores and checking the weather and and playing Roblox or whatever. And that's a big deal for him. And so that's his biggest consequence. Well, after a couple hours of kind of taking my blows, I finally was like, dude, uh, I, I have to take screens away. I warned you a bunch of times. And, and uh, so now I'm going to do it. And if you complain about it i'm going to take screens away into tomorrow too and he ended up 
getting screens taken away, not only for the rest of the day yesterday, but also today in its entirety. You know, he came to me after school, he got home from school and he said, Hey, you know, I'm sorry. What can I do about, uh, getting my screens back? Can I do anything? Uh And I like, I said, not this time, bro. Um, life, sometimes we just have to deal with the consequences and you knew good and well, I I told you what was going to happen. Uh, and it happened. And so I have to, as a, as your dad, I have to stick to my guns. Um, and you have to, you know, know what it's like to have to pay for the consequence of your actions. And so, yeah, it's funny you say that because I just had that conversation with him. I, I commend you because a lot of the time, uh, um, as parents of kids with special needs, a lot of, we want to, you know, shelter them so much, but they got to know that there there's going to be for every action, there's a reaction. And if you're choosing to do something that, you know, and I've spoken to you about, and it's not the right thing to do, then there's going to be consequences to the actions. Um, yeah. yeah. At my house, we have a lot of screens too. And, um, yeah. usually to get him to listen, I'm like, okay, if you're not being a very good listener, I repeat it twice. You're not being a very good listener. If you continue not to listen, then you're, you're I'm going to have to take your phone and your iPad. And he's like, oh, no, mommy, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm listening now. Right, okay, okay right. I'm going to do whatever you have to do. But, you know, it, it's, it's, this is such is life, right? Like, there's things that we need to teach our children, like, really give them real-world scenarios and to be able to set them up for success in the future. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of the time... Um, and then that school too, because I'm a special education teacher, but a lot of the time I feel like some teachers, because they have special needs, they want to treat them differently, like behavior, like consequence wise. And that doesn't really serve our kids. Our kids need to know that there will be consequences. Yes, you know, they need more explanation sometimes to help them understand what's happening and why it's happening. Like it can't just be like, you're just taking something away and not having a conversation. It has to be, you know, there has to be like a few more steps, but there's, there definitely has to be consequences all the time. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm a firm believer in that. In fact, uh, we did a YouTube video one time about tough love and how I'm, I'm kind of the hard nose in our house, you know, and, and I took some heat from some of the folks that watched that video and they commented like, Hey, you need to lighten up or whatever. And if you watch the video, you'll see that it was a pretty benign things. It wasn't, it wasn't crazy, but it, um, it was interesting to me because it's like, well, um, I, I have to give those people grace. They have no idea what it's like to walk in my shoes. I have no idea what it's like to walk in their shoes. And so we can't pretend to know the right call for each other's kids. Right. And so, um, And it's funny because my wife and I, I think balance it out pretty well. She's, she's very much a soft love uh, person. And, um, I don't like to use the word coddling because I've gotten in trouble for using that word before, but, uh, but where I am, uh, I might be a little bit tougher, uh, in the love department. She, she softens it up. And so, um, I feel like he gets a good balance of both. Yeah, I have to be good cop and bad cop right now. Yeah, but, um, right. I, the thing is, I have to enforce the law because since I am a single mother, um, you know, my mom wants to just kind of like, oh, he can get whatever he wants. I'm like, no, he can't. Right. You need to teach him that there's consequences to the actions and he needs to follow the rules. Like, the rules apply to him exactly how they apply to his cousins and everybody else in the family. Sure. So, um so he's on your son is autistic. Does he have any other um comorbidities? Like any other uh what is it? Does it no, mean? he's um I I kinda I I don't know if we I mean he's never been diagnosed for like ADHD or mm-hmm. anything else. Um he kind of, I mean, he's pretty severe learning disability, but he's also incredibly smart in terms of his memory he's he's got a absolutely incredible memory can you still hear me yes okay the the timer paused and your video paused so i want to make sure we're still good um yeah i can hear you 
and he um like school is tough for him, but if you uh, ask him to, uh, you know, recall all of the NFL games that happened yesterday, he will tell you every single game that happened, where they played, who they played, what the score was at the final. And so um, it, it's a really interesting th- uh, process to be in, but he, he's, He's so he's super, super smart with some things, but academically, just at school, he's, he's, you know, he's, he struggles. And so he, he's actually not on a path to truly graduate because school is so hard for him and school, uh, just being there and at a high school, public high school and having Mm -hmm. that many people and around him and that much noise and he just it gets overload for him and so he only does three classes we the school has allowed him to uh come and go through a side door um at the school so that it's more Mm -hmm. private and he's got a teacher that sticks pretty close to him and and all three of his classes are in like a little triangle in that same wing of the school and so uh he doesn't have any other diagnoses aside from autism um and his autism affects him in all kinds of weird ways and so like there are certain things where you're like there's no way that kid's autistic um and then other way and other uh things you'd be like oh yeah definitely and so it's a you know, it, you know, one kid on the spectrum, that just means, you know, one kid on the spectrum. Yeah. Right. And so, um, he's got, uh, he's got a lot of fine motor skills challenges, but at the mm-hmm. same time, like he can catch and throw a football, like from the trampoline, uh, like a madman, like he one handed catches and stuff like that. But if you That's ask amazing. him to cut a steak, he'll cut his fingers off. So it's kind of, it, it, it's a, it's a wild dichotomy of, of stuff. Um, he's an excellent snow skier. Um, and he, he, his eye hand coordination is pretty good, but like when you, mm-hmm. his, his handwriting, like you can't even read it. And so it's just super mm-hmm. strange, just the, uh, the different challenges from fine to gross motor skills and that sort of thing. That's interesting. He has a lot of splinter skills. So that's, that's, um, Special education, that's what we call it. So, like, okay. he's good in one thing. Like, for example, he's great in memory. He has long-term memory. Like, the processing from short to long-term memory is excellent for him. Um, I'm hearing he's really good at gross motor activities. So, his hand-eye coordination is good. Um, he gets a lot of free proprioceptive input, so he likes to, you know, be physical. But then, like, the fine motor things are a little bit challenging for him, which I've yeah. seen a lot. Right. Um yeah, it's, it's it's really interesting, and I love I love I love our kids so much. Like it just like like getting to know them and like really getting like exploring their brain and like the things that they excel at are just like phenomenal, phenomenal. Yeah. And it was just it, it, it's just it's so eye opening, and the way that our kids tap into certain parts of their brains mm-hmm. is so intriguing to me. Yeah, I so, don't know if you saw my story yeah. the other day. He like 10 days ago, he's like, Hey, it's going to snow here in a couple of weeks. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> and it was like, I, so we live in Eastern Washington and it snows all winter, but it doesn't usually start until maybe the first of December. And I'm like, bro, yeah. that's too early, man. That's too early. And then I stopped and I'm like, you know what? He's never been wrong. I'm not going to challenge him on this. <laughs> And literally, like three nights ago, he, I look out the window and it's snowing. And uh, oh my god! And and somebody else <laughs> commented on it. I, I was talking in the DMs with with another uh, person, and they think that their child can feel the barometric pressure, and that's how like sensory stuff for autistics. It's so wild, like they the way their brain processes things, like we don't understand it. And yeah, I you know, there's something to the way his brain processes things that's just otherworldly. Like I don't understand it. He he can hear different sounds that we can't hear, um, and he can like if we're in our boat and he's in the bow of the boat. Um, he, he can tell me to the mile an hour, how fast we're going based on the frequency of the motor. 
Oh so, yeah, it, there's just really wild stuff like that. And it's just fascinating. It's, uh, it, it's awe-inspiring, really. It, it's, oh, my God. Like, our kids just, oof. I had a kid that in, in class that I've, I've talked about this on the show before. I had a kid that would tell me, I would tell them, um, Billy, I'm just using a, a fake name. Billy, sure. I need to get to 42nd Street from our school. How do I get there? And he would tell me to the T, like, you need to transfer at this place and, and this exact location. And, you know, every single direction, word for word, without Googling it, like, this was all in his mind. Um, There's another yeah. child, not another child, it's an adult. They took him on a helicopter ride uh, over New York City. And then mm -hmm. they brought him back to a location to draw what he saw. He literally drew, like, every single building, every single window. It was a masterpiece. It spanned, I don't even know how many feet. Um, I'm going to link that. But it was just like, it's it's just like how their brains work is insane. Also, the man that um, created Pokemon, he's on the spectrum. So okay. think about the intricacies and like thinking about all those powers and all the things that, that those characters have. Like every single thing, like he was able to like visualize how they look, the powers that they were going to have and all of that, which is amazing. But Oh, that's amazing. It's it's I really love our kids. But um so tell me a little bit how when did you you and your wife notice that your son was different? Like when was well, he diagnosed more or less? So our situation is is somewhat weird in that um we had a sense right um, at the moment of birth and he came when, when he was born, he was gray as a ghost, like head to toe, no color whatsoever. It startled me so much. I thought, I thought he was, he wasn't alive. And, um, and she had a natural birth, your wife. Yeah. It was, everything was totally natural. Um, because he came so fast, there was no time for drugs. There was no time for anything. We literally like, I think I think he was born within five minutes of coming through the front door of the hospital. It was that fast, wow. and so okay. he. Uh, and the other thing that happened was that they laid him down on Jamie's chest and put a blanket over him, and he didn't make a peep. And it was strange to me. You think that an infant leaving that nice warm uh, environment into a cold. Uh, hospital room, you know, most babies cry. And um, so those two things were kind of weird. And I asked the nurses and they're like, no, we see that from time to time, both the gray and uh, not crying. And, and, uh, but something was funny. It was um, hard to put our finger on it. And the next morning, because he was a couple of weeks early, we didn't have his name figured out. And um, I was asking Jamie the next morning, I'm like, well, <laughs> what are we going to name him? And, and she and I had a conversation like, Hey, we, we both feel that something's a little bit different. And, um, like, like he's going to live life to the max. And so, uh, we named him max and it turns out that, uh, you know, there's a ton of autistic kids, uh, out there in the world named max. And it's kind of ironic <laughs> to me now, but, um, yeah, so that's uh, when things, uh, when, when he didn't make the normal milestones, we began to take a closer look. And uh, we got him early intervention right away because of our kind of parental intuition. We decided that, like, hey, let's, let's, let's go the extra mile and get him the help that he needs. And so I think at about six months, he was doing inter early intervention. And, wow. uh, we got in the birth to three program through our school district. And so we had a, we had a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, like a tutor come to our house and, mm -hmm. um, and help him out even like at a year old. And so at about a year, year and a half, we started looking at an autism diagnosis. And back then autism wasn't quite as prevalent as it is now. And the diagnoses yeah. were, the criteria were a little bit different. And at yeah, first they said, no, are he's one, are like about one year apart, our sons. So I feel like it's the same okay. thing. It was like one in 88 at the time, right? 
something yeah, like that? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And, and our doctor at the time said, you know, there's no, um, there's too much eye contact and too much touchy feely. Like Max is very huggy. He loves to squeeze mm-hmm. us all the time. And he provides a lot of great eye contact. And this was before he was talking. And so they could only go by body language. And they said, you know, I don't, we don't think it's autism uh, because he he's, excels in these areas. And so we went back to the drawing board and we were uh, doing chromosome testing. We were doing hearing testing. We were doing all these different things. Um, and then we sort of just gave up. Because it was like, well, all these things don't really have a meaning. It was like pervasive development disorder, not otherwise specified. You're like, what does that even mean? You know? And so we, right. And so we kind of just gave up. And then about three years old, his behavior uh, really went in the tank. Like it it got really bad. And um, then he began to exhibit a lot of those characteristics on that kind of diagnosis criteria sheet that you can look at. And so went back to the children's hospital and at three years, he was three years old. He was diagnosed with autism. And so that's, that's our journey from birth to about three, three and a half, I think is when he got diagnosed. But we just felt like, uh, at the end of the day, like it, it when it, uh, right from the day he was born, we knew that something was different. And mm-hmm. um, as things progressed, it kind of solidified that in our minds. Like, yeah, he's doing a lot of the telltale signs. He's lining up his cars on the on the carpet, you know, perfect lines. He's rubbing his feet back and forth together for an hour at a time, that sort of oh, thing. And like so. Yeah, so you kind of a lot of the stimming and stuff um, that it, you know started out really young, and and now we know exactly what it was, and so it was kind of um, we knew I think from the very beginning. Yeah, wow, that's so interesting. And and then the early intervention, he continued with it like until he got the diagnosis. Did they change the services once he got the actual autism diagnosis? So he stayed in the birth to three program until he was three. And then at three in our public school system, you can enter the developmental preschool. And so he did three years at the developmental preschool before he was ready for kindergarten. And at the point, at that point, he moved out of the developmental uh, side of education and went mainstream and he's been mainstreamed since kindergarten. And uh, all through elementary school, he was pulled out of class periodically and during different um, curriculum and that sort of thing. Or if he was not having a good day, had, a, had an episode or something and just needed an escape hatch, um, our resource room uh, was there for him. And so uh, his resource teacher through elementary school was an incredible person in his life and um, was there when it was like the scheduled times that he needed to be pulled out for occupational therapy or speech therapy, but also Mm -hmm. she was there for him as a a safety net when, when his day unraveled on him and he could just, he could jam to her class and have a safe place. That's so amazing. I love that you guys had that kind of support. So when he got the, when you guys got the diagnosis, how was the support from your family? I don't know, like, do you guys have a lot of family over there in Washington or is it just you and your wife and the kids? In our town, um, we have her, Jamie's parents and Jamie's sister and, and her family. And they've been huge assets for us. Um, my family lives a couple hours away, my, my mom and dad. Um, and then my siblings are, are a bit scattered out. And so, um, but my folks did, they were present a lot and they helped out a lot, um, in in those early years. And so two hours away, isn't terrible. They could, they could, you know, we could get there or they could get here pretty quickly, but yeah, we, we have, uh, that, and we have a pretty big, uh, support network with our friends and, um, we just like every other uh, family like ours, our friendship dynamics changed a little bit. Um, 
some people couldn't handle it and and you know for whatever reason decided that they would keep their distance um and i think everybody i think all of us families go through that to a certain degree with our with our friends um and then the ones that stuck close they literally told us like I'm getting emotional thinking about it. Sorry. They told us like, Hey, we will not let you guys fail and we'll stick by you. And, um, gosh, just thinking back on that, how, how critical that was for our family to have a friend group that sees what's going on and acknowledges that, whoa, uh, I don't think I could do this alone. That means they can't do this alone. So let's step in and help. And so we have uh, had a pretty enormous uh, support network from uh, not just our friend, our family, but our core group of friends too. I love that. Um, and I want to chime in and say that, you know, people that step up like that, it means so much. People think that, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, oh, they're getting, you know, early intervention. They got it. Because we, as autism families, we really, we tend not to show our hand, right? Like a lot of the time we, you know, have this facade of like having it all together all the time and, and not trying to ask for help because sometimes we feel like we can't, you know, so you know, a lot of people don't know, but the people that do know and like really stick with us and stick by our side and, and, you know, offer the help, even if like we never ask, but like that there, that we know that if any push, push came to shove, we can count on that person to, you know, take your kid or, 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 you know, go with you or run an errand for you. You know, that is so, so big. And, it's so important and like you 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 know you getting choked up like really like resonated with me because I feel like not so much my friend group my friend group is amazing right but there there was like some family members that really when we got the diagnosis kind of decided to step away in a way mm -hmm. and yeah you know we started seeing us being invited less to certain places or um if we were to come you know like kind of like you know the side eye or like like snide remarks and and it's so hurtful because the thing is like all we want is support we don't want we don't need anything from you it's just understanding that our kids are gonna function in a different way and that doesn't mean that they're less or that they're bad or you know anything like that you know just really yeah. understanding and being kind and and lending you know that that loving heart you know we're we we were placed yeah. on this planet to love each other it wasn't just just to do whatever you know what i'm saying so it's right. like mm -hmm. when we have that village that provides us the love and holds us and you know gives us the space to to be it's so intrinsic and it's so special so i'm so glad that yeah. your, your you know poor group of friends has been able to be there for you guys because that that's so important yeah, one of the things that I think all of us parents uh, deal with is there's a, there's a giant set of parameters that go along with our kids, right? Um, I call it the rule book. And it, we, we establish these rules throughout our child's growth and development. Like, hey, you can't have this type of food or mm -hmm. you really need to be in bed by this time or there's all these rules and for me it was we we had to be very careful on who uh cared for our child given the time of day or given given you know if it was an overnight thing because if any of the rules in the rule book got broken like the wheels just come off of everything right and so it's finding those people who not only come to your aid and say, Hey, we want to help. How can we help? We understand that, you know, it, we don't know what it's like to be in your shoes, uh, but we, we want to do something. So allow us to help. And those people that really genuinely want to help will also 
adopt that own, that same rule book for, for yeah. when they're caring for your child. And that's so critical. Like you got to know what that rule book is. And it's our job for as parents to say, Hey, uh, here, here are the certain hard and fast rules that we have to live by or, or the thing's going to fall apart. Um, yeah. and so one of the things that our friend group did is they paid attention and they listened and they watched and they're like, okay, so when I talk to Max, um, I use this tone or I um, use this volume or I don't, I, I don't get too excited. Like we've had football games in our house where if somebody jumps up and screams at a, at a play, Max like gets so startled that he doesn't want to see that person ever again. Oh, right. Wow. And okay. so, and, and so we got to, you know, people have learned over the years how to sort of uh, co-mingle with, with Max in a way that, um, you know, they understand the rule book and they know what they can and can't do. And if, if everybody acknowledges it and lives by it, then we have success. And those are the, those are the people that we want to want to try to find those people that understand that, Hey, there's a rule book here and I can't break any of these rules or, uh, I avoid my trust, not only with the kid, but with the parents. So, yeah, it's so important. Um, I, I, I'm so fortunate that I have like people in my village that I remember I, he first got diagnosed and I was like telling them, you know, what I've been learning. Cause at the same time, I, I, changed careers from being in business to being a teacher, special education teacher. Okay. So, you know, as I was learning, I was teaching other people, but then like those special people in my life, and I want to, you know, give them a shout out, my compadre, which is Aiden's godfather. He would like look up articles and his, and his godmother too, looking up articles and like, Oh, look, look at this. Um, and, uh, this is, um, you know, interventions that you can do and this is like other research that i found and you know did you did you try this diet and you know like just like really showing that they cared and that they wanted right. his best like him to be at his best and like looking for you know solutions for me in a way to you know help him uh thrive more which is yeah that is like you know, there's people that just like, you know, do the bare minimum, but like stuff like that, that was like, so like touching to me. Cause it's like, you know, you really, really do care and it shows, you know, and you're, you're showing me that through, through, through your actions. So I know that being the dad to your daughter was one way and then being the dad to Max is another. So how, how has that experience changed? Um, you as a father in general, like what have you, what has Max taught you? Oh man. Well, Max has taught me, um, how to see the world through different lenses for sure. That's, that's probably the biggest one. And he, by virtue of, um, what I mentioned earlier about, Hey, we don't know what it's like to walk in each other's shoes. Uh, he's get, it's just, just having him in my life has, uh, created an environment where I begin to see people differently. And now all of a sudden there's, there's more grace. If I don't agree with somebody's methodology or what, how they conduct their life. Um, I now recognize that there's gotta be grace because I don't know what it's like to walk in their shoes and I don't can't see life through their lenses. And so don't be judgmental. Um, and so he's just having him in my life has taught me those kinds of things. Um, and, uh, being a dad to a daughter and having her be, she's just, she's an incredible human being. She's, she's super smart. She's beautiful. She's, um, she's very outgoing and has tons of friends, has a boyfriend and is driving and like the whole thing. And, and so my parenting is so radically different for her than it is for Max. And I mean, I, uh, I, I run a business with her. She's 17. She just turned 17 the other day. And, and I have 
uh, we've started two businesses together and, uh, you know, she's, as she's grown up, she's kind of realized, well, okay, I'm not super interested in this anymore. Let's shift gears. And so we started doing something else. And so, um, there's a ton of pressure put on her, uh, where Max doesn't have pressure and we talk about it and we're totally open and transparent in our, in our home. Like, Hey, we're, I'm a different dad to you than I am to Max. Um, and I, I, uh, expect more out of you than I expect out of Max. And you want to know why is because I know that you're capable of so much more than you even know. And so you turn that around as sort of a encouragement and a, and a fire lit under her. And so her relationship with me uh, and our relationship is so much different. I, I look at her as, uh, um, you know, she's moving out of that sort of parental daughter type uh, relationship and into kind of like she's getting older and she's got a boyfriend. Now all of a sudden I'm like kind of the friend and I'm, I'm oh, wow. talking to her about guys and I'm talking to her about business and I'm talking to her like, you know, and, and I'm allowing her to make a ton of her own choices now. And where I'd never let Max make these choices, even at, uh, you know, e even in two years, I can't even imagine when he's his age or her age now, I still can't imagine yeah. letting him make these decisions because of her maturity and because of the leadership skills that she possesses and all these different things. And uh, so it's a wild ride uh, being a dad um, in my home because my two kids are so radically different that um, I have to be two different dads. And um, it, it's, it's fun because it's such a challenge. Um, and I, I'm a melancholy personality type, so I like to feel things really deeply. And so when something's going wrong in our home, it's heavy for me. It's really heavy. Yeah. And so um, I've found out many, many years ago that I'm, if I don't take good care of myself, I'm susceptible to depression. And so um, I have to do a lot of like mental health exercises and physical fitness and spiritual stuff, like all these things. I'm working on my wellness all the time because um, I really want to be the best dad I can be. And with Max, like it takes everything <laughs> for me to be that man. Cause I, there, there's so many times where I just get frustrated or I, um, I I'm a human, you know, and I make mistakes and I come down on myself and I, get frustrated with myself. And then, and, and so, um, it's a wild, wild ride. Uh, and, and so being, uh, me to my kids, um, it, it, like I put on totally different hats when I'm with my daughter than when I'm with Max and, and that's okay. And it's, and it's fun. And I get to do funny things that are in their own right with Max and I get to do some funny stuff. Um, and they're too, uh, senses of humor are radically different, but they're both hilarious, you know? And so, um, but it's wild. And I, and I, um, I always say that I'm, I'm literally a dad in two different families because of how radically different my kids are. So, yeah. That's amazing. But, um, so you're, you're already doing the segue for me. So let's talk about, you know, the work that you're doing regarding mental health, self-care, and parenthood like I know that you've your Instagram platform is catering to that to encouraging other parents and encouraging people to work on their mental health and to take it into account and to care about themselves so you know let's talk about how you do that for yourself and then how do you encourage other parents well um, let me preface this by saying that my my journey my path uh, is it everybody's cup of tea? And cause you're going to hear some things that are a little bit crazy. Um, and so I'll just preface it with that. But I, I've noticed that in my life, I have to put difficult things in my path. If, if life's going well, uh, and I'm not being physically challenged or mentally challenged or even spiritually challenged, I begin to become complacent and I, and complacency always ends up leading to 
uh, mental instability in my life. Um, and so I do some pretty radical forms of mental health exercises. I take ice baths. I take a cold shower every single day. I go in our sauna. We have a sauna in our house. And so I am continually subjecting myself to painful things because I want to always be tough. And I always want to stand in the face of adversity and be able to know what to do calmly and, and make the right decision in the moment. And so I put uh, really hard things in my way uh, you know, as a methodology to sort of, um, train myself to take the adversity or the challenges or whatever you want to call it of being a parent of an autistic son. I want to always be in shape to handle those things, whether it's physical, mental, or spiritual. I want to be able to be in shape enough to, to, to handle those things. And so, uh, one of the things that helps me the most with mental health is physical fitness. It actually begins to rewire your brain, right? The uh, hippocampus in your brain, um, different neurons start firing when you do physical exercise, and it it helps the you know your brain um, not think about your current situation in the same light it's to put some more positive spin on it and so you begin to be able to kick depression by doing physical exercise and so I do a lot of physical exercise the room behind me is a gym and it's uh, in use every single day um, wow. and so I have to I feel like, you know, some people look at me crazy or they're like, dude, you got to screw loose um, because of how serious I take it. And maybe that's the case. Maybe I've got uh, some stuff that could be diagnosed. I don't know. But here's the deal. If I um, if I stay on top of that stuff and I and I take that stuff seriously, my life goes so much better. And so. Uh, I choose to do difficult things and I choose to do them as a training tool uh, to be stronger um, uh, mentally and spiritually. Physically, I don't have to be strong physically. Ma uh, Max, uh, he doesn't get violent. I mean, he has in the past, but I don't feel like I... I mean, there are some parents out there where their kids twice the size of them and yeah. the, and the child acts out in violence. And I, I don't know how those, those parents handle that. Um, yeah. and, uh, I don't, luckily I don't have to do that. So my physical fitness is really just a mental health thing. And so, yeah. um, that's where I struggle is, is being bogged down in the mental weight of, uh, all of the issues that we have as parents of special needs kids, like what's going to happen in the future and what's going to happen tomorrow and how am I going to handle this one thing or that thing? And so, um, that, that's really why I do that. And I just like you recognize that when you get that diagnosis or when you understand that your, your child's going to be different and you're going to take a different path, you, mm -hmm. um, you dive headlong into figuring out what that's going to be for your child. You find them help and you, you go to the ends of the earth to figure that out for them. And every parent I know, including myself, forgets to take care of themselves along the way. And then all of a sudden, all those things that you worry about, like who's going to be there for my kid? Well, <laughs> you, you, you got to worry about yourself if you want to go the distance yes. with your kid. And so... Um, my biggest encouragement and why I have that, uh, plat that Instagram account is simply to encourage moms and dads to, Hey, well, I know it's, it's hard. Take a step back, focus on yourself. We're going to make some lifestyle adjustments. We're going to do, so I'm going to, you know, have some encouraging words. We're going to do some exercises together that do different things where, Hey, we, you, you've got a mountain of stuff you got to tackle every single day. And so mm -hmm. let's talk about our lifestyles and taking good care of ourselves in little small bite-sized chunks. Like we don't have mm -hmm. to go out and 
do some, run a yeah, <laughs> or do some huge fitness program or go to some mental health retreat or any of that stuff. What we can do as parents who are busy from sun up to sundown is uh, focus on little bite sized things. Like here's an, here's an adjustment I'm going to do. And, and it's Monday and I might not make another adjustment until next Monday, but I'm going to, I'm going to slowly chip away at some things in my life that I can do to be healthier, better version of myself so that I can be a better parent for my kid. Like I, I say it all the time. I'm not trying to win a beauty contest. Um, I just want to be a good dad. And so, um, and, and that's why I do it. That's why this room is here in the house. And that's why I do a lot of the, the cold baths and the cold showers and stuff. It's, I just want to be focused and in shape and the best I can be because my kids deserve it. Yeah. So I want to touch on two things. So that's one, like one of the main reasons that I got, I was, I was going like when I, when I separated from my son's father, I was going through like a lot of depression and my way to deal with it was eating. Right. So I ended up being like extremely overweight. I lost the weight, but it wasn't so much that I wanted to look prettier it was more like, I want to be able to keep up after this kid because Aiden was like one of those elopers. So I right. used to have to like, you know, bolt after him. So, you know, the the physical fitness came in there, but then the mental health piece was, I found myself, you know, I, I tend to be depressive kind of like you, but I found myself in a point that I was just down there and I couldn't get myself out. So mm. that's when I started looking for help for therapy and things like that. And then looking for community. So, you know, all of that is so important because the thing is like, you know, we worry so much, like what you said, we worry so much about what, what's going to happen to our kids, but we need to make sure that we're there right. to be able to take care of that kid. Those kids are our priority. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. us taking care of our mental health is like taking care of them as well. So um, those ice baths, I wanted to say, um, I practice Kundalini yoga and they, we don't do like a full subversion in the ice bath, but like five minutes or whatever, like at the end of the shower, you, you turn off the hot water and let it, sure. let the cool wa water run down. It works so well because like after you're done with the meditation and the, and the yogic pra practice, you know, you're taking like a, a um, a shower that you're being conscious about what you're doing but then like the the cold water helps you like activate things in your body it just it's so good and it's so beneficial yeah and so and people good. people that's think great. i'm crazy for for doing it uh but i i usually get like two colds a year like a this when the season changes i'll get a cold and i started doing a daily cold shower three years ago um and i Aside from a little bout with COVID, I've, I haven't been sick in three years. And as the first time I've ever gone that long in my life without getting a cold. Wow. And um, I think it's just a really good immune booster. Your body's like in fight mode all the time. Um, I do, my cold showers are wire to wire. I get in cold and get out cold. And I think what, what's going on is when, the, when, I'm try, when my body's trying to warm up, I think that's when the real work is happening because for the next half an hour to an hour, I'm kind of still cold, you know, and I'm, and my body's mm -hmm. fighting to warm me back up. And I think that's when, when your body's in fight mode all the time and just ready to, uh, like all hands on deck, we gotta, we gotta protect this, this human. Uh, I think that's when, when the work is done. And I, I'm a huge believer in that, uh, in, in cold water therapy. And I think that, I mean, think about it. If, if you're not, if you're not sick and you don't have a cold, then you're a better parent. It's hard to be a great parent yeah. when you're sick. And so, uh, even if it's just for that, then, Hey, great. I, I, I can parent well because I don't have a cold. And, um, yeah. but the, the, but the real benefit is that, um, I just, there's, it's so many things. It's like I said earlier, most of it is just that mental grit that you learn from, all of a sudden there's this external stimulus hitting you that's very uncomfortable and you've got to learn how to cope with it and deal with it mm -hmm. and make wise decisions even in the midst of it. And so um, that's why I love it so much. 
<laughs> so besides the ice baths and the working out, is there anything else that you do to pour into yourself? Oh yeah, I'm a Christian and my relationship with Jesus Christ is um, is absolutely paramount in my uh, spiritual health. And You there? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. My iPad just completely failed. <laughs> no worries. So we're almost done anyway. Um, We were saying... How, what else do you do to pour into yourself, right? Oh, yeah. And so I, I was kind of speaking to the, the spiritual component as uh, I'm a Christian and mm -hmm. my relationship with Jesus Christ is the only way I think I could uh, be who I am and parent well. And so um, I believe that if you're working on your uh, holistic wellness, whether it's your body, mind, or your spirit, you need to be working on all three because they work in concert with one another. And if you're failing in any one of them, the others start to suffer too. And so along with the physical fitness that I do and the mental fitness that I do, I also work hard on my spirituality. So I'm reading my Bible every morning. And I'm involved with my church. I'm on a couple different committees. In fact, I have a board meeting here in a few hours. But, um, and, and then surround myself with like-minded people who uh, are also in that same boat. It, and so we can, you know, iron sharpens iron sort of, um, you know, that spiritual component comes through a community of other people uh, that believe the same way that I do. And so... Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it in a nutshell. And and I um, I never I, I I was always an active person, and I was always you know an athlete and that sort of thing. But I I never considered uh, what wellness you know mental health and spiritual wellness uh, you know accompanying physical health uh, meant until I was a parent of a special needs kid, until I was actually forced to recognize it. It was 2012, I think, when I uh, went through a really severe bout of depression. And I swore up and down when I crawled out of that hole that I would never go back there. And so a lot of what I'm doing um, has that like I, I have that in the back of my mind yes I want to do this for my kids I want to be a good dad I want to be a good husband I want to be the best human I can be in God's eyes and um but in the back of my mind there's always this hey if you let off the gas you might succumb to depression again and you don't ever want to go back there Chad so get, get in shape so that's kind of um that's why I really push so hard on the on the wellness stuff, and um, and I I can't be alone, you know. I mean, you said it yourself. You're, you're talking about it in your life, and I I'm imagining that everybody watching this right now um, acknowledges something in their life that could do you could be a little better in when it comes to your wellness, and so. Yeah. Um, we're all a work in progress. We're still working on a lot of stuff in our home, but it's so crucial if we want to be uh, the best parents that we can be and provide the best for our kids. It's got to be um, a main focus in our personal lives. Yes, I agree. So are there any little things that you do for self-care? Like I know you guys go for walks with your son, which I love. Um, is there anything else that you guys do for self-care? No, I mean we pretty much uh uh you we pretty much touched on all of it. I I did a program a year ago called 75 hard and it's a program it's it you know some people call it a fitness program, some people call it a weight loss program. It's not any of those things. It's a it's a self-discipline program. And um it makes you work out twice a day and stick to a diet and take a progress picture and drink a gallon of water. There's all these things that you got to do and you got to do them for 75 straight days. And when I did that program a year ago, a lot of things stuck. And so because a lot of those have to do with wellness, uh, I still do a lot of them. And so I'm, we're doing a morning walk. My, Jamie and I do a morning walk every day. 
and um, we're fortunate enough where our kids are old enough to where we can leave them home and they're safe, right? Uh, not not all parents get that play, uh, get that luxury, and uh, but now that we're you know far enough along in our journey, we get to do that, and um, so we do that, and and I am a huge believer in um, taking the time out to uh, let the dust settle and hang out with your partner, and so Jamie and I uh, make sure that we do a lot of stuff where. It's just her and I where we try to do, I mean, it's funny because we, we're probably together more throughout our day than any other married couple. We walk together in the morning. We work together. She, we're business partners. And then we work out in the, in the evening together. And then we do family stuff. And so we're together all the time. Um, but that's, uh, that's, uh, that's another form of the self-care that I suggest everybody do is if, if you are in a relationship with uh, someone who you're parenting with, make sure you're taking the time to um, be alone with them and, and have some quiet time with them um, and work on, you know, talk about the struggles, talk about things that are going well and really focus on your guys' relationship. So <clears throat> not all of the focus is being put on your parenting journey. And so that's a, that's another thing that, that, that I do and that Jamie and I do uh, together for self-care is just make sure that we um, put the time in on our own relationship. And we, we actually see a marriage counselor. Our, our marriage is not in jeopardy and we're, we're doing fine, but we see a marriage counselor just as sort of a maintenance thing. And yeah. uh, it's really good. And we, and our counselor has asked us a number of times, Hey, do you, do you want to be done? And we're like, no way, man, this is, this is great to, I mean, and I, I always say, just because the uh, your car's running great doesn't mean you stop changing the oil. So it's a maintenance True. thing for us. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's amazing. But I, I'm a, I'm a huge believer in in lots of different modalities and lots of different ways. And I that's where my encouragement comes in to other parents is, um, you know, be paying attention to all of these things. Um, I and the reason I do it is because I learned the hard way. And I, I got to a point where I did not want to be in my life, emotionally and physically, and and I don't want other moms and dads to get to that point. I want to catch that before anything bad happens, and encourage them to um, to take better care of themselves. So that's it in a nutshell. I love it. Thank you so much, Chad. This was such a good conversation. So oh, you're I'm welcome, end Marcy. Show how I usually end it. Yeah. So I'm going to end the show how I usually end it, which is follow me at Comadreando Pod on Instagram. And you can follow Chad at Soul Ambition One on Instagram. Yep. And if you have any questions at all for me or Chad, please feel free to send me a Comadregram via email at marciacomadreandopod.com or slide up into my DMs. Uh, comadres, don't forget to log in to www.comadreandopod.com for your Comadriando merchandise. Um, and I want to thank you for spending time with your comadre and your compadre. Chad, you're now a compadre of the show. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Marcy. Thank you, Chad. Bye. Have a good one. Peace.